I worked one New Year's Eve at a very nice French restaurant. I was wearing a tuxedo. This was a super fancy place. Mike Lynn was like many young adults in the US, working in restaurants and bars to pay his way through college. I had a customer put a stack of $5 bills on the table and tell me, this is yours. But every time my water glass gets empty, every time there's more than two or three ashes in my ashtray, I'm going to remove one of those $5 bills. And I hated that guy because he was using tipping to lord it over me and implying that I wasn't otherwise motivated to do a good job. I mean, it was just kind of demeaning the way he treated me. And tipping allowed him to do that. Some of us will think nothing of throwing down a few extra coins after a good meal. For others, paying a little more will be unheard of and could even be considered insulting. Why does this custom exist in some places and not others? Is tipping spreading across the world? And is that a bad thing? This is The Food Chain from the BBC World Service. I'm Greer Jackson, and for answers, I've turned to two restaurants who've done something rather counterintuitive. One restaurant in Shanghai has introduced tipping, despite it not being the norm in China, whilst another in New York has banned gratuity. Both did it wanting the best for their employees, but the difficulties they faced highlight some simple truths about the culture of tipping, which may make you think twice when you next reach for your wallet. I love to tip. I mean, I think um, I watch out for people's performance as servers, and if they do very well, I, you know, I do tip generously. Xi'an Chong has been in the United States for 30 years, mainly working on Wall Street. He and his partner would go out for some home comforts, but would find the quality of Chinese food pretty poor. What's available is always either Americanized Chinese food or OK food, but the service was lacking. I remember an incident back when I was still in college. I went out with my parents to a Chinese restaurant and the server was so rude and they even spilled soup on my mom and they didn't say anything. So we always said, well, if we had a chance to open a restaurant, it will be different. The what-ifs soon became a reality. By 2011, they'd quit their jobs and opened Cafe China, where they serve up Sichuan delights like fried pork and chilli oil, slow-braised ribbon fish and spicy diced rabbit to clientele perched on red chairs. When we opened the Cafe China, it was a... nobody knew us. We were in a quiet block, and for the first couple of weeks, We had maybe two or three tables a day. And then we got some press in the form of an article on the New York magazine. And the next day, lunchtime, the line was out the door and my servers called in sick. So I had to, you know, fill in as a server and I had no idea what I should do. And I was um, running around like a chicken with his head cut off. Most of my customers didn't get any food for lunch, and they waited for an hour and a half. <laughs> oh, so, so I spent the whole time apologizing to all the customers who were walking out the door, you know, had nothing to eat. And I was thinking that, you know, great, now nobody's going to come back. Thankfully, they did. But it did show Zian how valuable his waitstaff were. The year after they opened, they were awarded a Michelin star, and this spurred them on to open two more restaurants in the city, China Blue and Birds of a Feather. As their empire expanded, they needed help running the restaurants. They needed a manager. But they struggled to find anyone willing to do it, and Zian blames tipping. To understand why he thinks that, we first need to get to grips with tipping, wages and the US law. And with 50 states, each one with their own standpoint on this, It's more complicated than you might imagine. Thankfully, we're about to meet someone who's going to uncomplicate it. My name is Mike Lynn. I'm a professor at the Cornell Hotel School, and I've been studying tipping for over 30 years. 
We heard Mike right at the start of the show with his story about the stack of $5 bills. He says that the US tipping system exists thanks to nobles of Tudor England in the 1500s. Nobles would give money and clothing and food and other gifts to the household servants. And then when visitors came and stayed at the manor, they would also give gifts to compensate them for the extra work that their visit entailed. And from there, people started giving tips in taverns and commercial eating places. Ultimately, it spread to the tipping that we know today. And it came to the United States in the late 1800s when Americans would go abroad and encounter this custom of tipping and brought it back with them. Today it's so widespread that if you don't leave 15 to 20 percent, it reflects pretty badly on you. And whilst this figure remains fairly standard across the US, minimum wage is not. Workers are divided into tip staff, front of house, wait staff, bartenders, and non-tipped workers, chefs, runners and pot washers. And if you're tipped, the minimum wage is lower than non-tipped workers in the majority of US states. Employers of regularly tipped workers are allowed to pay a sub-minimum wage and to count tips to make up for the difference. And how much less is that tip minimum wage? At the federal level, the tip minimum wage is 213 and the regular minimum wage is 725. But there are states where the regular minimum wage is much higher and yet they use the federal tipped minimum wage There are also states where there's no difference at all. California, for example, has a higher regular minimum wage and the tipped minimum wage is identical. So what happens if your tips don't add up to minimum wage? Your employer is supposed to make up the difference. How often that happens, I don't know. But at least legally, the employees are protected. A little over $2 an hour doesn't sound great, and statistics from the U.S. Department of Labor back this up. It reports that seven out of the ten lowest-paying jobs are in the restaurant trade, and of those seven jobs, four of them are tipped. Of course, the story is somewhat different in high-end restaurants in big cities. I helped pay my way through school, waiting tables and bartending. I was making more per hour than my managers. Really? Um, Yeah. So how much was that? (laughs) <laughs> We're talking 30 years ago. I don't remember exactly. Um, but I do remember at the time remarking, why would anyone want to be a manager? You make more money per hour, certainly, in front line working for tips. That's because although managers take on more responsibility, they're not tipped workers, which can mean they earn less than the servers. Which brings us back to Zian's struggles. He couldn't find anyone to help him run his three Chinese restaurants in New York City. And the reason it was is because the uh, four staff are paid so well after tipping that there's no incentive to become a manager. I have people who have been managers in other restaurants coming to me and say, look, I, I don't want to be a manager anymore. I just want to be a bartender. So, to make the manager role more appealing, Zian decided to scrap tipping and take control of how much his employees were paid. We gave the staff the same pay as they would if they had been tipped. So we basically calculated how much everybody would be making had the the tip been there and divided by the hours that they worked, and that's their new wage. And so how did you do this? Did you increase the price of the menu? Did you add a service charge? We did raise the price a little bit, but we were concerned that it might affect the customer too much. So we raised on average about 10% of the menu price. But banning tips didn't go down too well with the servers, and several resigned. Karina Lee was one of the new hires that came in to replace them. She was a head server, so had a higher basic wage than most of the wait staff. And in any case, she knew about the tipping ban when she applied for the job. But when she arrived, she says most of the team were not happy at all. I think a lot of the sentiment was basically that they were making a significant amount less than they'd been um, when there was tipping. Team morale was pretty bad. 
um, there was kind of like a sense of tension between members of the team, especially those that were like veteran employees versus those that were new employees. I think some of them perceived the new recruits as being naive or, you know, that we were just unaware of, you know, how much better it was before. And I think that there felt amongst a lot of members of the crew that there was just no incentive to really give their best when it came to service. Some of the servers were doing like what they felt like was the minimum necessary. What did that mean in practice? How did that affect the restaurant and how it was run? I feel like, uh, A, because certain people were not pulling their weight, and then B, because there was perhaps a little less incentive to kind of take more tables. It did mean that more staff were required overall. What did the customers think of it? There was initially a bit of confusion, but then a sense of acceptance, although it was like a regular occurrence that you would hear customers, you know, oftentimes express the desire to continue to tip even when they understood that they shouldn't. And so what would you have done in that situation if you've been told, hey, you know, we're not doing tipping anymore, yet someone offers you a tip and clearly really wants to do it? What would you do? Well, the official house policy is that you're supposed to inform the guests that there's no need. Sometimes you would discover that guests had nonetheless left a tip. And in such cases, what should have been done may have been um, that you don't add that additional tip. And most servers did observe this, but perhaps there may have been some cases where, you know, those tips went through nonetheless. I should also add, by the way, since I'm talking about this, one other thing I do recall certain guests bringing up was that, so I mentioned earlier that some guests may have wanted to tip more. But there were also those guests who actually chafed at the idea of being automatically charged when they felt like the service quality was under par. But for Zian, the biggest impact on the business was having to employ more wait staff to do the same amount of work. The labor costs went through the roof. One of my restaurants actually was losing money for the entire time that uh, we implemented no tipping. It was not realistic to maintain no tipping. So we put plug on that after about a year and a half. So what do you do about the manager situation now? Right now we don't have like a, a general manager that oversees everything. Uh, we have a manager who does part of the general manager work and then the rest of it we give to uh, senior servers. I see. Okay, so all the tasks are divvied up amongst the wait staff. Right. Sian's not the only person who tried to challenge the US tipping landscape. And speaking to Michael, I'm beginning to realise that retaining management staff isn't the only potential problem that this custom creates. There's not as much evidence on this as I would like, but the evidence we do have suggests that attractive waitresses get better tips than less attractive waitresses. Whites get better tips than blacks, and that's true even if we're controlling for service quality. A stat I find particularly maddening was that if a girl wears a flower in her hair, she can expect 17% more tips on average. And consider the role of power here, where a customer can lord their control over a server with a threat of not tipping. Michael's story about working New Year's Eve and the stack of $5 bills if he didn't fill the water glass promptly enough, that's just one example, but I'm sure there are many others just like it. Given all the troubles we've heard about, why would you want to introduce this custom into your restaurant if tipping wasn't that common in your culture? Next on The Food Chain from the BBC World Service, we speak to one woman who's decided to adopt tipping in her Shanghai restaurant. My name is Atina and last name is Kuo. And my Chinese name go by Guo Xin Rui. And I'm in Shanghai right now and I have a three restaurant named called Shibo. We spoke as the dinner time rush had just begun. Oh, it's going to be very busy. We are overbooked tonight. Oh, really? (laughs) (laughs) It's Friday. It's before Chinese New Year. So a lot of company hosting annual party and some group dinner and a family dinner. Yeah, it's quite busy. Now, tipping is pretty unusual in China. A few restaurants are trialling it. But on the whole, it's a fairly alien concept. But when Atina was working in a high-end hotel, she saw the system in action and felt it was a good thing. I have been working in this industry since 2009. But before 2009, 
I used to work for Marriott uh, International Group, and um, it's very common to tip in in the hotel because they felt, oh, I'm in a fancy hotel, a nice hotel, is a nice way to tip. But in Shanghai, people often don't tip. And that I feel like uh, our service and our staff are not really appreciated because it's a very difficult job. The staff are earning is not high, they don't earn very high salary. And I will be appreciated if the customer enjoyed our food, enjoyed our environment, if they um, can also recognize this and then tipping our staff. But I think uh, it's a culture thing. Some people think, oh, uh, because Chinese people are a little bit introvert, they are a little bit shy. So when you try to tip them, they like to rejecting your force, even from they actually happy that you're tipping them. So sometimes people do get confused: should I tip or not? So here I'm trying to uh, encourage our customer, like. Okay, so you actively talk to the customers and tell them tipping is a good thing if you enjoyed the service. I do. <laughs> yes, because sometimes people, um, like some of the restaurant, you do tip based on the location and based on the money you spent. So if you go to some fancy restaurant like Michelin Star or fancy hotel, people can connecting with these fancy words to the tip. Well, like a casual dining restaurant like us, sometimes people don't uh, just think, oh, we don't need to tip them. But I think everyone who's working in the service industry, they deserve to be appreciated and then more respect. So how do you show this respect? In my way is if you're happy, you tip them. Obviously, it's very normal in places like the US and the UK to tip, but you're saying it's not very common in China. And I just wondered what your local customers thought of you introducing or trying to encourage them to tip. Oh, sometimes they just laugh it off and they say okay. And yeah, although I try to encourage them, but sometimes they just not comfortable. But nowadays, um, as we uh, ordering a lot of takeout service. And we ordering a lot of food, so normally you have to uh, tip. Sometimes during bad weather, a lot of people are starting to tip the um, delivery guy who deliver food to you. So I think the tipping culture is slowly getting started, but it it just haven't like been encouraged by everyone. And she thinks that as a result, the service has improved. Her wait staff work harder, and they say they feel more motivated. 是差不多两年多了。我是云南人，我叫陈高清。I have been here almost two years. I'm from Yunnan province. My name is Chen Gao Qing. Tips are hard to predict. Some clients just leave their change, like a few dollars. But if it's a big group of customers, they could give you dozens. If some customers tip us, of course we are happy. And we thank them, but if they don't, then that's normal. I don't think I would treat them any differently, and of course we won't complain. None of us would do so. My name is Min Jie. I've been working here for nine months. Once we serve a group of foreigners, they left about ten dollars and implied that was a tip. I refuse at first because I don't think we accept tips. The customer was unhappy and felt disrespected, so our manager reminded me of the culture difference. Then I accepted. Whenever we get tips, our restaurant manager collects them and spends it on team building activities for us. Sometimes the customers would tip only one waiter, even though many of us have served the same table. So I think the current arrangement is good. When you get tips, you feel satisfied because your work being acknowledged by customers. Then you feel motivated to work harder. Atina thinks that tipping is becoming more common in her line of work because of the influence of tourists. Something Michael also said, but it's not a new custom for China. Tipping is embedded in Chinese tradition. And customs because it existed widely in traditional Chinese society, in imperial and early republican China. So I think it's not something completely alien to us. It's not something 
that is imported, you know, from the outside world. It's something that disappeared. Dr Liz Gu is an academic from Liverpool University here in the UK. Prior to 1950s, we did have tipping. It was common, I think. The reason is that prior to 1950s, the waiters in restaurants or hotels received very little pay, whilst the customers were generally from upper class. So you see the income gap was huge. But all that changed in the 1950s when Chairman Mao came into power. It's a time characterised by state ownership, which, Liz tells me, included the restaurant industry. From 1950s on, China transformed its economy into planned economy. So between 1950s and 1990s, all restaurant and hotels, service industries became public sectors where waiters were paid regularly and their pay structure was similar to that of public servants or any member of staff working for government sectors. Apart from the basic salary, the employers may contribute to the pension and medical insurance. They may also get, for instance, free accommodation and meals. So the narrowing of the pay gap meant that tipping sort of became obsolete. People just didn't do it anymore after this planned economy. That's true, because the customers who came to dine in those hotels or restaurants may not earn much more than those waiters in the planned economy system that lasted for three or four decades. After Mao's death in the 70s, there was more economic reforms, opening China to the West. Most hotels and the restaurants were restructured and they became private sectors again. But I think the pay structure was still similar and tipping came back to, for instance, four-star hotel, five-star hotels and a very posh restaurant, posh bars. And the bartender in a four-star or five-star hotel's tips may surpass a basic salary. Do you think it might spread beyond these high-end hotels and bars? Well, if the income gap in the coming years would become larger than tipping, you know, would I think it would come back to some ordinary restaurant as well. But at the moment, I wouldn't see that happen because the income gap is still quite small. So unless the income gap broadens significantly, Liz thinks it's unlikely to spread beyond the high-end hotels and restaurants, restaurants like Atina's. But we wondered what Atina's customers felt. Did they resent tipping? I don't usually tip here in Chinese restaurants unless the waiter really impresses me. Also, I'm influenced by my expat husband. I was quite surprised when I saw him tip for the first time. So I asked him why he did it. Why not save those few dollars for ourselves? Most Chinese would think like me. But my husband said he also has a family to feed. That totally convinced me. They work hard in their jobs. A few dollars means nothing to us, and they deliver a good service. So we reward their service, right? I'm willing to do so in a fine dining restaurant if the waiters offer really good service. On the one hand, their wages are low, so you might feel sympathy for them. But this isn't about sympathy. This is to show respect. Their work deserves our respect. And also, you want to encourage the service industry to become better. You know, Chinese people, especially those who have lived abroad, think the service here is not good enough. So if in China there are more places encouraging tipping, I'm sure many people would be willing to tip. What's a tip? Tip isn't a financial stress for me. I don't feel pressured at all. 
When you walk into a certain restaurant, you know they expect tips. If I don't like it, I shouldn't have chosen that place, but I've chosen to accept it. So then, I'm willing to follow the tipping rule. It's interesting to hear that most of Atina's customers are in favor of gratuity. If the service is good, then the server deserves it. But rather counterintuitively, Michael's research suggests that there isn't much of a link between good service and tip size. When I stand outside of restaurants and interview customers about the dining experiences they've just had, I find that differences in customers' ratings of service explain about four percent of the variability or differences in the tip percentages they leave. So there's not a very strong relationship between a server's delivery of service, as perceived by his customer, and the tips those customers leave. If you talk to servers and ask them, "Are your tips related to service?" about half of them will say it's moderately to strongly affected. And so, for those servers, they're going to work harder. But about half of servers accurately recognize tips are largely independent of my performance. So, if we don't tip for good service, what are we tipping for? Michael thinks it could be to do with guilt. The anthropologist George Foster argues that we tip occupations where we're concerned about the server's envy. Tipping in most Languages around the world translates to drink money or money for drink, and he argues this reflects the origins of tipping in eating and drinking establishments. And what he said was that customers in bars, in taverns, who are having a good time, are concerned that the wait staff who are serving them are not having a good time and are envious of them. They may take it out. They could spit in our drink or do other things. But also, we don't like people to think badly of us. And the customer leaves this money to say, "Hey, yeah, I'm having a much better time than you right now. But you know, don't take it out on me. Don't envy me. Here's some money so you can have a good time later." Mike Glenn, bringing us to the end of this week's program. Many thanks to our guests this week. If you'd like to get in touch with us, then please do. Especially if you're a server or perhaps a manager who's tried to embrace tipping in a part of the world where it's not customary, or vice versa. We'd love to hear about your experience. I'm on Twitter at Greer Jackson or email thefoodchain at bbc.co.uk. From me and producers Simon Tulit, Siobhan O'Connell, Stephen Ryan, and Josh Thorpe. Thanks for listening and goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>